Hey, Ankeny Free family, happy October. Thank you for joining with us in worship this morning. We're so excited that you're here. If you are new or visiting us this morning for the first time, we would just love to connect and, and get to know you better. One great way to do that is to reach into the seat in front of you and grab a little connection card. You can fill that out and place that in one of our offering boxes in the back of the worship center as you leave today. Or just connect with us online at ankenyfree.church. You click that connect button and you can connect with us that way. Ankenyfree.church, also a great place to find out about our upcoming Harvest Week, any other events that are coming up soon, as well as Bible studies, and uh, really just anything you want to know about Ankeny Free Church. There are two big things happening on Sunday, October 16th that we are very excited about, so mark your calendars. Um, the first is that we will have our theology class starting up once again. This is a weekly class that will meet Sunday mornings, and they're going to begin this series of classes by walking through the Apostles' Creed together. This is going to be an amazing opportunity for anyone who wants to dive deeper into their faith, learn about kind of the roots and the foundational beliefs of the Christian faith, why we believe what we believe about God and His Word. Um, so we definitely do encourage you to head over to ankenyevents.church and read more and learn more about the theology class starting up on the 16th. This next announcement is for the guys. Join us right here at Ankeny Free Church on Sunday, October 16th, starting at 3 p.m. for smoked meats, appetizers, a cornhole tournament. Uh, it's gonna be Bills versus Chiefs football on the big screen. We did this last year, we had a blast, so we're doing it again. Uh, last year, I know we had a lot of guys bring a neighbor, brought a friend, brought a coworker, and it's just a great time to kind of bring guys in to connect with other guys and just share the love of Christ and have a blast together. So definitely encourage you to sign up for that also at ankenyevents.church. All right, well, we have a special guest with us today. We have Aslan McCarthy, straight from Togo, West Africa. And Aslan, if you wanna step on in here, and if you want to just share with us just a little bit, maybe about what God is doing through your ministry in Togo, and then maybe just a little bit about how we can be supporting you and praying for you as a church family. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to do that. God has been doing some amazing things in Togo, and it's just been a gift to be a part of it. We're seeing so many people give their lives to Jesus and become disciples of him to look more like him every day. And it has been an absolute joy to be able to partner with these new disciples. And I would just like to ask that you would join us in praying for specifically for these new disciples that are being made, that they would be um, that they would be able to grow in the Lord, that they would uh, have a desire to uh, to seek him and all that they're doing. And really, ultimately, our, our desire is that these disciples would be able to make more disciples, who make even more disciples and more disciples, so that we can see uh, more people in Togo and in the neighboring country of Benin reach for Jesus. So we, I really just appreciate your guys' prayer. Thank you so much for the ways that you've come alongside me already. And uh, I'm just excited to see what else God has planned. Well, Aslan, thank you so much for being here. And Aslan and I are just about to sit down and record a little podcast together so you guys can learn even more about Aslan's life and what's happening in Togo. So we're excited to share that with you guys. Um, Aslan, how would you like to do the call to worship today? I would love to do that. Let's do it. All right. This morning's call to worship is, is something that God has really placed on my heart. And it, it really talks about the unity of the church and how we need to be united as the body of Christ. And it comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Well, good morning. If you would please stand and join us in singing.
morning. My name's Todd. I'm one of the pastors here at Ankeny Free. It's good to have you here with us. This morning, we're going to be taking the Lord's Supper together. So if you were somehow missed as you came in to get one of these little communion kits, if you just raise your hand, one of the ushers will come and they'll get one to you. Just go ahead and go ahead and raise your hand there and someone will be there in just a moment. What this is, is it's an opportunity for us to remember and to be spiritually encouraged and refreshed as we think about the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and what that means for us. What we're going to be doing today is this, is um, we are going to be, um, there's going to be a time of meditation where you can sit there and reflect on what the Lord has done. We'll pray, then we'll, we'll close, we'll open here with some readings from the, the Word of God, and then we'll take the bread together, and then we'll drink the cup together. If you are not a follower of the Lord Jesus, we are glad that you are here. Um, this is a great opportunity for you to just sit and reflect. Um, the t- opportunity to do communion is for those that do trust in the Lord Jesus. And if that is you, this is a fantastic time as we focus on God's work for us. So if you would, bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we ask for your grace. Help us, Lord. And I pray that right now your spirit would stir inside of us. That that you would uh, bring to mind maybe anything that we need to share with you. Or even to give us focus on what you've done for us in sending your Son. Speak to us in the quiet of this moment, we pray. Father, we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. And he gave his body for us in order that we might be united with him. Buried in a death like his, given new resurrection life. We thank you, Father, that that Christ's blood was shed for our behalf, a, a covering, an atonement, such that we might have forgiveness of sins, given a righteousness that's not our own, a purity to which we could never personally attain, a life that we could never earn. Lord, we thank you that that we are able to remember what it is that you have done for us through Jesus For it's because of him that we are here. That's in whose name we pray. Amen. Hear now the words of Holy Scripture. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Father, we thank you as we remember what Christ has done for us and how he's changed and transformed who we are. 
you didn't leave us here without purpose, but instead you have a mission for us. And Lord, we can approach the things you have in store for us with joy and hopefulness. And so, Lord, we ask that your Spirit would work inside of us, that we would be filled anew, that we would be able to sing your praises, and that our hearts would be opened to hear your word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. If you would, please stand.
seated. I love listening to you sing, Ankeny Free Church. There once was a young pastor, really young, um, and he was officiating his first wedding. He was very nervous, officiating his first wedding, young pastor, very nervous, you know, really anxious, really anxious, um, and he goes to his senior pastor, and he's like, hey, do you have, you know, any advice for me, I'm, this is the first wedding I'm officiating. I'm really nervous. Uh, just give me some wisdom. And so the senior pastor was very gracious to him and said, yes, of course. Um, when and if you get nervous, just out loud, quote scripture, and that will help settle your nerves and that will calm your spirit and you can just kind of get back to, you know, officiating the wedding. So he goes, okay, that's great. So it's the day of the wedding. The groom is there at the altar with this young pastor and the bride has made her way down the aisle and it's the auditorium's full of, you know, their closest family and friends, all 200 of them, right? And it is just a great day. The young pastor launches into um, the uh, officiating the wedding and then at this random moment, his mind goes blank. He loses everything. He lost his train of thought and he is really struggling in the moment. His um, palms are sweaty, his knees are weak, his arms are heavy. He might go home and eat mom's spaghetti, but that's a different thing. That's for a different, uh, really small section of the crowd might get that this morning. I don't, maybe you got that or not, but He's really anxious. Then he remembers the advice his pastor gave him, and that is to recite scripture if you get really nervous and anxious. And so the the groom is there, the bride is there, everyone is there, out loud, he goes in front of everybody, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. (laughs) Oh, goodness. This morning... We're finishing our four-week series uh, called For Better or For Worse. And, you know, it's been a series on marriage and relationships. And, you know, I, I, mean, I, I pray that these, you know, today in the last three weeks, you know, whether you're married or not, whether you've been married in the past, whether you've, all, you know, been single your whole life, I don't know, you know, what your context is. But regardless of where you fall, Like, I just pray these times have been helpful for you. A good reminder, a good encouragement, a poke, a prod. Um, I was talking to a gentleman after the first service, and he's like, well, thanks. I want to go in the corner and cry now. Um, And I was like, hey, I'm preaching to myself too. Um, And so I I just hope these times have have been good for you and your household as we examine God's word and truths from uh, the Holy Scriptures. Uh, today, we are uh, talking about trust. Um, trust, the type of trust that, you know, Matt Campbell has in his kicker, um, uh, the type of trust. And hopefully, you and your spouse and your marriage have a different outcome, that you don't miss the mark. Not one, not two times, but not three times. Um, it's a little, little sore this morning from that. Um, Talking about trust this morning. Turning your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 as uh, we're going to see what God's word has to say about building trust in your marriage. Well, a husband was sitting in his living room and it was a lazy Saturday afternoon or whatever and he was reading this article and his wife was there with him and, and, and the article said that uh, women use 30,000 words a day to a man's 15,000 words a day. And he read that to his wife. He thought that stat was very interesting. His wife quickly, almost too quickly, replied, that's because we have to repeat everything to men. (laughs) To which the husband went, what'd you say again? (laughs) So in case you didn't hear me the first time, uh, we're in Genesis chapter 2 this morning. Uh... So we're looking at trust in marriage. You know, last week I had the privilege of uh, 
meeting a couple in our church. I don't remember if it was after first or second service, forgive me, but um, they told me that they uh, had been married for 70 years, 70 years. And it got me, first of all, that's amazing. Um, but it got me thinking like, man, what are, like, what's like the world record for like the longest marriage? So I, I did some research and forgive me, this is just the, the most relevant thing I could find. Uh, the Guinness Book of World Records in 2005 said that Percy and Florence Aerosmith uh, held two records. The first one is the longest marriage of a living couple. That's 80 years. And also the second record they held was having the largest married couple's aggregate age, 205 years. Both Mr. and Mrs. Aerosmith, you know, they've since passed away, but they left some really good advice for those of us who want to have a strong, long-lasting marriage till death do us part. Florence, the wife, she said this, you must never go to sleep angry if you've had a quarrel, you make it up. Never be afraid to say, I'm sorry. And I thought that was, man, that's great advice. That's great advice for really anyone. Percy, the husband, had slightly more humorous advice. He said the secret to his long marriage was really found in just two words, yes, dear. (laughs) <laughs> so, to all the women said, amen. Uh, we're in Genesis chapter 2 this morning. Hopefully you found that in your copy of God's Word. Genesis chapter 2, I'm going to be reading from verse 21 to, down to verse 25, the end of the chapter. Um, whether you're looking on with a neighbor or phone, tablet, physical Bible, just make sure God's Word is in front of your eyes. Genesis Chapter 2, and I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. I'd encourage you to follow along or listen along as, as I read out loud. Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then he said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and old, fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Bow with me as I pray, please. Lord, we're thankful for this time to gather together and we ask for your help. We ask for your help in in paying attention. We ask for your help in cultivating the soil of our souls so that when, in just a moment, when we receive the message, when we are preached to from your word, your holy, precious word, that it not land on hard soil or 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 soil that is uh, covered with rocks or thorns or thistles, but that it would land on soft, tilled soil so that it may grow roots and produce fruit in our lives. Father, regardless of where we are this morning on the scope of marriage and relationships, whether we're married or whether we're engaged or whether we were married but not right now or whether we've never been married, God, I just pray that this time be a help to everyone here, uh, be an encouragement. Uh, and, and maybe, Father, if you will, it be a little bit of a challenge to us as we seek out your scriptures to understand how to build and keep trust in our marriages. Father, help us, help me to communicate your word clearly and speak through me in a mighty way. Uh, Lord, we love you and we're thankful for this time. All God's people said, amen. amen. Well, I have uh, five points to help us walk through our passage this morning. The first point is kind of like an overarching point, and it speaks to the relationship between a husband and a wife. And the last four are four ways to build slash keep trust in your marriage. And so you see point number one, you see on your notes, uh, parity. 
Point number one is parody, verses 21 to 23. Here we have the making of the woman to be a help meet to Adam. Observe that Adam was first created and then Eve, and if man is the head, uh, Eve, the woman, is the crown, a crown for her husband, the crown of the visible creation. The man was dust, redefined, but the woman was double refined because she was taken out of man. And God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. Now, why did God make Adam fall into a deep sleep? Some um, theologians think, and I would agree, that the reason why God just didn't go, poof, here's a woman, here's your helpmate, here's your wife, is that man cannot observe God in the act of creating, that God's miraculous creation, creatings, permit no one to observe. Now, the rib that the Lord took out of Adam is not a metaphorical rib, as maybe you have heard in, in previous you know, Bible studies or sermons. This is a literal rib, and the language of one of his ribs pictures a long curved, glistening rib, still moist with Adam's fluids, still warm with his marrow. And no, men don't have one less rib than women. Um, For the rest of Adam's life, he had one less rib than uh, Eve, but all of Adam and Eve's children, including all of us, we can really count them all, and men don't. I remember being in Sunday school and having my Sunday school teacher teach me this, and I remember ca- trying to find the space where there's, the, there's a little broken up part in my ribs. That must be where God took that rib to create Eve. That doesn't, that's not a thing. Uh, Adam and Eve were not created ex nihilo, meaning created out of nothing. God didn't create them out of nothing. Adam was created out of the dust of the ground, and Eve was created out of Adam's rib, and she was made from the same stuff as Adam. The same bone, the same blood, the same DNA. And the woman's creation out of Adam is the basis for her equality with Adam. As the Puritan Matthew Henry puts it, and I love this, Matthew Henry said, not made out of his head to top him, not out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. I love that. God brought Eve to Adam. Can you imagine that moment when God presents Eve to Adam? Adam lays eyes on his wife, and she is a mirror of himself, but with some very agreeable differences, as Adam learned. The second thing we notice from our passage this morning, and really the first way to build trust in marriage, to keep trust in marriage, and we see this from our text, is priority, verse 24, priority. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother. You know, when God designed the marriage covenant, he did so with the intended special commitment between a man and a woman that would be more important than any other human relationship. That is the reason God commanded a man, the man, to leave his father and mother for the cause of of marriage. The word leave here in verse 24 is the Hebrew word azab, which literally translated means to loosen or to relinquish. So when God said that a man should leave his father and mother when he's married, he meant that a man should relinquish the highest position of commitment and devotion previously given to his parents so that that position could now be given to his wife, his new wife. To put it simply, God designed marriage to operate as the most important human relationship in our lives. It is only second in priority to our personal relationships with God. If we put our marriage in any position of priority, 
other than the one God has instituted, it will not work. If you examine any problem that may exist in your marriage or maybe some around you in their marriages, it won't take you too long to see that many of the issues that married people walk through in life are the result of misplaced priorities. In fact, untold millions of couples have ended up in a divorce court because they failed to properly uphold the priority of their marriage covenant. Millions of other people, uh, married people, live frustrated, strife-filled lives because they have misplaced their priorities when it comes to marriage. I have a couple ways that we can prioritize things in our marriage. The first one is prioritized communication. Prioritized communication. You know, you can't microwave communication and, and nothing can substitute for good communication between a husband and wife. One of my professors in college always said, and this has stuck with me, communication is key. Communication is key. I just remember him saying this over and over and over again in a biblical studies class when talking about the marriage relationship. If you are too busy to talk to your spouse, then you have to find another area of your life to sacrifice rather than sacrificing your marriage relationship. Prioritizing our spouse means our marriages have to be the first priority in our lives in real terms. There's no possible way you could be obeying the law of priority and not communicating with your spouse in a manner that satisfies his or her desires or needs. You know, I heard of a story of a husband, he looked at his wife as he turns on the first football game of the football season and says, well, if you have to say anything, say it now. (laughs) Another way we can prioritize uh, things in our marriage relationships is prioritized um, relationships in our marriage. So if you realize your children have possibly replaced your spouse as your first priority, man, you need to make that right. First of all, you need to repent to your spouse and ask them for forgiveness. Second, you need to stop responding to the constant demands of your children. Of course, love them. Of course, care for them. Of course, shepherd them and disciple them. But don't allow your children to violate the boundaries of your marriage as they consume all of your time and energies. Train them to respect your marriage. Also create new disciplines in your marriage to redirect your time and energy to your spouse in prioritized uh, ways, in in a regular manner. Even though many times the passions in the marriage have maybe faded at this point because of problems that have existed for some time, that doesn't matter. Do not let your feelings dictate your actions to your spouse. Do the right thing and the passions of your marriage will return. The last way that we can prioritize things in our relationship is prioritized romance. Prioritized romance. Anything that isn't growing is static and will eventually become entropic and die. In other words, if it isn't growing, it's heading in the wrong direction and will only get worse. Therefore, when a relationship stops growing and loses its focus and passion, it will get worse over time until it eventually dies. Let me ask you just some questions and answer these to yourself. I will say it again if you're not listening. Please answer these to yourself. Do not answer these out loud. It'll be very awkward if you answer these out loud. People will look at you differently around here if you answer these questions out loud. When is the last time you did something cute with your spouse? When is the last time you made out randomly? When is the last time you wrote them just a silly note? It might be stupid, it might be goofy, but man, it makes them smile. When is the last time you had a date night? When is the last time you went out of your way to show your love to your spouse in a way that makes them know, man, they're thinking about me, and man, they care for me, and they love me. A married couple had a quarrel, 
and ended up giving each other the silent treatment. We've all been there, right? right? Those are just great moments, the silent treatment. Those are great. Two days into their mute argument. My goodness, this is lasting a long time. The husband realized he needed his wife's help. I was waiting for the wives to say, amen. No, that's fine. In order to catch a flight to Chicago the next morning for a business meeting, the the husband needed to get up at 5 a.m. and he was known for just constantly hitting his snooze button, so he needed his wife's help to make sure he actually got up because he could not miss this flight for this business meeting. But also, not wanting to be the first person to break the silence and, you know, kind of give in, he wrote his wife a little note on a sticky pad, set it on her nightstand that says, please wake me up at 5 a.m., The man woke up the next morning. His wife is not in bed. He looks at the time, and it's 9 a.m. He had missed his flight to Chicago, missed the business meeting, and before he walked out of the bedroom to find his wife, to find out why she had not woken up at 5 a.m., he went to the restroom, and he looked up in the bathroom mirror, and there was a sticky note on his forehead that says, wake up, it's 5 (laughs) a.m. third thing we see from our passage this morning is pursuit. Pursuit, verse 24, hold fast to his wife. From the very beginning, God has revealed to us the secret of staying in love, and it's work. Marriage only works when you work at it. The mistake that causes a marriage to begin a downward slide is not work, but the lack of work. Taking each other for granted and trying to just coast on the sled of past memories and events, man, that just just creates a negative energy that causes relationships to slide backwards. Just because you live in the same house, just because you have children together just because you maybe share a same bank account does not mean you will feel anything for your spouse or have a strong relationship. For the rest of your life, you must work every day at your marriage for it to be rewarding and healthy and life-giving. When you stop working on your marriage, your marriage will stop working for you. In many ways, marriage is like the muscles in our bodies. When we exercise them regularly, our bodies become strong and, and healthy. However, when we, when we lie around, when we don't exercise, our bodies become weak. And the more we lie around, the less we exercise and the weaker our muscles become. Marriage only works when you work at it. It requires energy and effort. It requires time and for you to try. The, the, the degree to which you are willing to work at your marriage relationship is the exact degree to which it will work for you and for your spouse. Here's the big question regarding this issue. What are you working to accomplish in your marriage? What is the point of all of our efforts? The answer is this. We should be working to meet the needs of our spouses. You and I should be working to meet the needs of our spouse. And their basic needs might be very different than ours. They might be similar. They might be the same. But regardless of where they fall on that spectrum of, man, my wife or my husband is completely different than me or needs different things than I do, or, man, we are very similar in a lot of ways, regardless of where you are on that, you need to be working to meet the needs of your spouse. Therefore, for needs to be met and mutual satisfaction to be achieved in in, in any marriage, one element must be present in both spouses, and that is a servant's spirit. For your marriage to work, for your future marriage to work if you're single, you need to have a servant's spirit when it comes to your spouse. Your spouse needs to have a servant's spirit when it comes to you. The greatest marriage on earth is two servants in love. And the worst marriage on earth is two selfish people in love. To understand this issue, we must realize that when we get married, we are at each other's mercy, 
when it relates to getting our needs met. My community group this past uh, year, we went through an eight or nine week study on marriage. Uh, we went through Paul David Tripp's book on marriage. It was very good. And one of the main things I took out of that study was that spouses need to almost be in a competition to see who could outdo the other one when it comes to selflessness. Hear, hear me correctly. I didn't say selfishness. I said selflessness. See who could be the better servant to the other. See who could put the other first more. Who could take the back seat when it comes to your needs, your wants, your desires before your spouse's. The greatest marriage on earth is two servants in love. Fourth thing we see from our passage is partnership. Into verse 24, the two shall become one flesh. Now, <clears throat> this obviously has uh, more meaning than just sexual intercourse. Verse 24 states a law of marriage that permeates every area of life. Once we understand and obey this law, we will experience a significant depth of unity and bonding in our marriage. However, if we break this law, even innocently or on accident, the damage to the trust and intimacy of the relationship, man, it can be severe. To understand the full meaning and implications, the law of partnerships has in marriage we need to consider this truth. Marriage is a complete union in which all things previously owned and managed individually, separately, are now owned and managed jointly, together. There are no exceptions. Anything in marriage that is not willfully submitted to the ownership of the other person is held out side of the union, producing sometimes legitimate jealousy. The act of becoming one flesh involves so much more than sex. It involves merging everything owned by and associated with these two persons into one jointly owned entity. If there is something a spouse is unwilling to merge into the marriage, that spouse is breaking this law of partnership and violating the rights of the other spouse. The law of partnership is absolute in marriage. We must share everything as equals. The number one enemy of the law of partnership is dominance. It destroys intimacy because it doesn't want to share. It wants to control. And as human beings, we were created by God to relate to our spouse as equals, relate, them, relate to them everything. Control is against God's design. You know, God created marriage in the Garden of Eden, and the word Eden literally means pleasure and delight. This is important for us to remember because so many people today don't relate marriage or their marriage as pleasure and delight but they relate it, relate it to pain and to suffering. But the fact remains that God originally designed marriage as a relationship of ultimate pleasure and delight. Adam and Eve were created beautifully naked without shame in a wonderland of intimacy. They were equals. They were complementary equals to each other. And as such, they shared their lives in peaceful intimacy as God designed. Our fifth and final point this morning is we see purity as a way that we can build and keep trust in our marriage relationships. Verse 25, they were naked and they were unashamed. You know, in marriage, we start out instinctively desiring to share ourselves with each other. However, for this to take place, there must be a prepared and protected atmosphere in our marriages 
that provides an environment where we can regularly get naked with each other. And I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about emotional intimacy. I'm talking about spiritual intimacy. I'm talking about areas in our life, every area of our life, where we can undress every area of our life before our spouse and not hold anything back from them. Be our true selves in front of them, with them, by them. Let them see who we really are. Let them into our past hurts. Let them into our problems. Let them into things we're struggling with. If there's things in your life that you're holding back from your spouse, then you're not walking in purity with them. You're not allowing them to see your whole self. You're not allowing them into your life. How can a relationship truly grow if there's not 100% trust, 100% accountability, 100% openness between you and your spouse? Healthy nakedness must happen in the special place with the right person in the confounds of marriage. And before we close, this is the fourth week of this series, the last week of this series. If you're here for the first time this week or you've came to all four weeks or somewhere in the middle, And if you've sat through one of these sermons and you've thought, man, my my marriage is struggling. You come to church, you act great, you go to things, you act great, but man, you know deep down that there is some real issues there. I wanted to let you know that number one, we love you as a church. And the second thing I want you to know is that we are here for you to help you. And so if you've sat through any of these sermons and you have thought maybe it might be a good idea to bring an outside voice in, to reach out, to bring in a a third party, to help us navigate some of these issues, to maybe bring God's word and godly wisdom into our relationship, I can't encourage you enough to reach out to Pastor Todd or to myself or to a trusted friend here, possibly in this room with you. And we can help you walk through this season of struggle as almost everyone who's been married has walked through a season of struggle. You're not alone. You're not the only one that's gone through some tough stuff in your marriage, so take heart. There's light on the other side of this. It's okay, the Lord is with you and he knows what you're walking in. And so seek the Lord as the band comes. When we close out this series, I wanted to read, I couldn't really think of a better way to close this sermon and this series than to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn there. And here Paul writes a, just a masterfully written encouragement, challenge, and command. A command, I'll say that again, a command to husbands and to wives. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 22, and I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. And if you don't have a Bible, I'd encourage you just to sit and to listen to what Paul has to say to husbands and to wives. His command. Ephesians 5, verse 22 Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her 
that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands, should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for the time we've been able to circle around your word together in this room this past month. Lord, we need you. Father, for those of us who are married in this room, Lord, each married relationship is two sinners married to each other. There's no perfect marriage. And so, Father, we ask for your help and grace and assistance. Father, help all of us to look to you, to seek you, to love and honor you in all ways, to love and to respect and hold up our spouses. Lord, I'll I'll say again as a word of encouragement, if there's anyone here that is struggling in these topics or issues, Father, let them them find someone who can maybe help and encourage. If that's someone on staff or a, a good friend, let them not walk through this struggle alone. Because, Father, even though you're with us, we need the presence of a good, godly person to share with us your wisdom and your truth. Father, bless and help and guide the marriages in our church. Let them be strong as to remind the world of the perfect relationship between your son and the church. Lord, we're thankful for this time. I'm thankful for my friends. Lord, give us a good rest of the day as we go out and do what you have for us. Thank you, Lord. All God's people said. Would you stand, please, and let's let's close this morning. Make this our prayer that Christ would be glorified in all that we do in our relationships and in everything. Let's join together singing. Where creation suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified the whole earth echoing his eminence his name would burst from sea and sky from rivers to the mountain tops we hear Christ be magnified 
strong and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be for my feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation. I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just a doorway. Join you in your suffering, and I'll join you when you rise. When you return in glory, with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing, my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Oh, Christ be It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment that so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Go in peace.